So something that we come across quite a lot, I think, in the service is is the scenario where people have kind of been around the block a bit, seen lots of physicians, doctors, clinicians, etc., and and kind of because they've not had a good understanding of pain, perhaps, or it's been intimated, perhaps this is to do to do with your head. People kind of get that message. How how do we handle that when people present like that? That's a difficult question, but uh, I think it's really difficult to begin with. But I think generally the patients who come into our service have they've been through a process where they've, they've seen clinicians where it's all been about the symptom of pain and trying to cure the pain. And then when they can't cure the pain, they see the next clinician and then, then they eventually sort of end up with ourselves. And I think what we we tend to do, we'd, we'd never say to a patient, we understand pain is processed by the nervous system, but we would never just say to the patient's in your head. It's about listening to the patient, listening to their story and, and understanding that pain in the context of that patient's life and that allows you to develop a therapeutic alliance and then perhaps talk about how pain actually works. And rather than saying to the patients, right, this is how pain works, asking them those questions, do you want, do you know much about pain? And often the patients that we see, they have very little knowledge about pain. And I think with the, the growing body of literature, it's actually showing patients can understand about pain and how by understanding about pain, that can reduce things like fear, catastrophization, because Previously, I think often it's all been around this pain equals damage and that leads to things like fear, avoidance, etc. And I think from my experience, patients tend to be up for trying something new because often the stuff what they've tried before hasn't really worked. Mm. I, I don't know if you find that yourself, Chris, or... Mm. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's some really important points there, isn't it? You know, I think people come in um, with lots of different, you know, expectations and often different understandings for pain. And I think um, part of I agree, part of our role really is to try and explore that. And what do people really understand about their pain? How do they um, how do they see their pain working? What's driving the pain? Do they know about the nervous system? Do they know, you know, that pain isn't something it does it doesn't reflect tissue health. We know that it's a um, you know it's a it's a very uh, it's a very good thing that we have for protecting ourselves, but it's not a very good indicator of tissue health and it's not a good indicator of damage. And I think often when people, um, I suppose, uh, are open-minded to, to, to understanding more about pain, particularly as the, the literature, as you said, it's, it's become a lot clearer about, um, about certain things in pain. We know, um, you know, we know that it isn't about uh, damage. We know that it isn't just about those things. It's far more complex it's much more about a combination of a sensory experience where there's um, nerve impulses going into the nervous system and then the combination of experience and um, and uh, expectations the kind of mashup if you like of those the sensory information on the and cognitive experience that the output does is pain and or, or sensory experience on that sensory experience may be painful and so it's, I suppose it's um, helping people understand that when I guess it's people perhaps unkindly say, you know, it's it's in your, it's in your head or something like that. And it's it's not in your head. It's not in your in your psychology. It's a complex problem. This is in your brain. This is you, you need a brain to feel pain. But um, it's about how all of those things are processed, and the output of that will give you pain if it's appropriate for, for you to have pain. It sounds weird to talk about these things, yeah, doesn't it? No, no, I don't think that what <clears throat> makes sense there. The yes, the pain is worth. The, the nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain, that's where the processing takes place, but it's then, it's the impacts then, isn't it? Mm. And often they're the things that then drive the pain even further. And I think that's what fascinates me is sort of untangling mm. the stuff what's mm. winding up this nervous system. Uh, and like I said, and often patients have got great experiences how they have managed this pain well in the past, and it's often about helping the patients reflect on what's helped in the past and maybe exposing back into some of that stuff. In, mm. in the future and I'm sure I'm sure as a psychologist mm. you, you see that sort of more than more than sort of most of the stuff like on a daily basis I, I think I meet a lot of people where you know they can have the more fr- frontline approaches and then we're at the point where actually the context is trying to live the best life you can despite pain being around and, and often I try and understand well what is important to that particular person what would what would better look like if life was better despite pain being around? And often it's stuff like having a greater sense of purpose or focus. Sometimes it's about letting go of something that there's just 
too difficult to do right now and, and shifting that energy onto something that's more doable perhaps but has a similar kind of meaning for the person um th- there's lots of ways i think of working with living well despite pain and i think that also taps into the nervous system stuff so that um people then kind of start doing things differently and thinking differently and that in turn feeds the kind of nervous system processes and feeds that pain output with the hope that for some people pain might feel a bit more in the background i guess so it sounds like in your consultations there's very little talk about pain but consequently often by making other changes in your life pain can sometimes especially with like neuroplasticity the system can sort of dampen itself down but that is not your goal that often happens in the background yeah exactly and i think that's the big shift that i've seen in physio where i think as physios our our goal and our our focus has always been around we've got to do an intervention to get rid of this pain so every time the patient comes back there's just disappointment yeah because often when you find out what's important to them and often when patients come to me in the physio clinic, it's, it's around function. I can't bend my back anymore. And then when you're, and obviously being patient-centred, you look at them doing that movement. And often what's happened over the years, they've developed sort of like maladaptive ways of moving. And what's the scary thing is often that this has come from previous clinicians that see in the past who perhaps put fearful things into the head. And we know that those type of things can ramp up the nervous system. Yeah. So mm-hmm. often as a clinician, we'll explore different ways of moving mm-hmm. and have things like relaxation and breathing can, well, we know it can dampen down the nervous system, but often you ask the patients, what's, e- what's the, e- the easiest way to bend your back? Tense up, move really slowly, look for the pain or relax, belly breathe and pick it up and often say, yeah, that's much easier. And what mm-hmm. fascinates me is that sometimes that makes pain a bit easier yeah. and that gives control and, that, yeah. and, and there's good evidence <clears throat> that that can dampen down the because you mentioned a, a, a word there, I think I think you said neuroplasticity. Yeah. And uh, I think I mean it's quite a, it's quite a hot topic, mm-hmm. neuroplasticity and, and pain, isn't it? How do you kind of apply that with 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 patients? How, how do you explain that? That's a really good question. I think I think whenever I see a patient, I think it's really it's really important they understand how pain works and the mechanisms of pain, and that's difficult. And I think. To be able to do that, you have to strike up this this therapeutic alliance. So mm. <clears throat> often, I've been really fortunate to work with psychologists like Becky, where you can you can help develop that. Because often, when you leave physio school, you don't have those questions to develop those relationships. And I think when you develop those relationships and you understand, like I said, you understand their pain and how it affects their life, you can talk around how that can sort of wind up the system. And that's one way. And I think that's really important because if patients got in the head that pain equals damage, that's that's really difficult but also little things like when you're when you're assessing patients from a physical perspective like when you touch them the back really lightly and they get huge volumes of pain asking the asking the patients do you, do you think that can cause you any damage mm-hmm. and often they'll go well no and then then bringing in actually they know that the nervous system can sort of be involved in that and i find that's a really really helpful strategy of sort of explaining pain yeah because it's personal to them and they can relate to it i do something really similar as well because you know when you're doing uh, you know when you're examining somebody and like um <clears throat> i think neurophysiologically we you know we know that we conduct um nerve impulses into the nervous system for various things like temperature and mechanical stimulus and, and pressure and, and chemical stimulus and um when we can demonstrate or we we, we can examine a, a bit of the body that's the, the doesn't have pain and it's got normal calibration people can say yeah that feels like pinprick that feels cold or that feels just like normal rub and then when you do that in an area where there's a lot of pain around there i mean you it sounds like you've you've done fairly similar stuff as well and it's um it can be off the scale so the perception of the same pinprick in a normal area to in the painful area is hugely accentuated and is not them accentuated that's the nervous system yeah. that makes it much much louder and so we get this sensory drive going into the spinal cord and the spinal cord generates a lot of that and what that serves up to the brain then is a hugely amplified version of what we should be experiencing normally yeah. and the brain often doesn't know what to do with that does it and i think you know we probably assess things you know medically and, and physio ways we assess in the same thing yeah. really mm-hmm. but it's it's kind of getting a handle on how much sensory drive there is going up into the brain yeah and mm. and that's a really <coughs> nice link there becky where yes the brain is processing it but it is a physical thing this pain mm-hmm. and mm. you're making that link and i think that's yeah. 
that's like validating their experience yes it is in the nervous system but this is the way it influences how you experience pain yeah so going back to the it's all, is it all in my head then is that what you're saying actually what we're saying is no it's yeah. it's the whole of you it's your it's your structure your scaffold it's your it's your brain it's your nervous system it's the whole of you that's involved in processing pain and, and yeah. how that impacts yeah. on you and yeah. that means there's things you can do to, to, to change that in some ways yeah. you might yeah. not get rid of yeah. pain but it, you can yeah. change how you respond and react yeah. We, we serve noughts and ones into our nervous system, don't we? I guess through our nerves. We can either send an impulse or the nerve doesn't send an impulse, which is like a computer at the end of the day, noughts and ones. And then it's up to the brain then to interpret all of those noughts and ones. And so absolutely it's about how our nervous system and how our brain will handle all of those things and all the experience that we have of our day-to-day -day life. Um, and whether something's threatening or whether it's not threatening or whether you know we anticipate pain if we're going to move and we know that we're going to get pain if we move all those things kind of feed into it don't they There's loads of different layers to this and it's 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 sort of creating new experiences <coughs> as clinicians as a physio what fascinates me is that patients have often perceived certain movements as associated with pain so they become massively fearful but like i said before if you can change how they move and move them in more relaxed manners and and patients are able to do it with often with actually I thought that was going to hurt a little bit more I thought it was really really going to hurt and then repeating it and repeating it and then you create new experiences yeah mm -hmm. so when you put in that position again you've done it that many times and practiced it and learned how to do it more relaxed the brain often sees it less as a threat mm -hmm. and often mm -hmm. that then can open up for them doing more important things in life mm -hmm. rather than being sat in the like in front of the likes of those mm -hmm. and actually getting on with the life mm -hmm. I, I think this is all about hope isn't it hope for yeah. change <laughs> Um, I went to a talk in uh, Breathworks in Manchester and, and they shared the idea of thinking of your brain yourself as being like a brain gardener, prune the connections you, you, that aren't so helpful to you and grow the connections yeah, that you yeah. want more of and, and that maybe translates into how you go about your life, how you think about pain, how you think about living well and all these kind of yeah. things that tie in together, thoughts, feelings, behaviours. And what I'm hearing there is that pain is actually a single dimensional thing but it affects us in so many different ways so we don't adopt these sort of multi-factorial approaches where we look at all the different facets of pain pain management is often limited yeah and i think that's what we often find just looked at one facet of it mm. as we're saying actually this is a lot more complex mm. yes the nervous system processes the system but the output is massive mm. i think it's a really nice way of, of looking at it as pruning stuff that um that isn't helpful and growing stuff that is and we know through um through certain study or through through a number of studies that have been done in particular pain conditions, that there is changes in the cortex and the brain handles stuff in different ways. And then so clearly that, that translates our experience of pain, our sensory experience and emotional experience of pain, translates into physical changes in connections in our yeah. brain functions. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, we, we, we've seen it, haven't we, on um, on scans structurally the brain, the brain changes mm. for people mm. who've had pain for a long time but mm. it's not to say that it can't adapt in a different direction and mm. it's the thing that gives real hope isn't mm. it this is you know it's maladaption and adaption yeah and we can you know move into a, a things that a, a situation where things are a lot more you know a lot more hopeful just out of interest there chris i know you talked about patients <coughs> where you, you assess them physically and there's the signs of like allodynia by the signs what you're talking about have you seen patients where they've come back and they've gone through a period of rehabilitation? Have you reviewed that area of the body? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because often it shrinks, doesn't it? And I had somebody in clinic a couple of weeks ago. Explain so, allodynia first. Allodynia. Yeah. yeah, it's pain from an innocuous stimulus. And so it's, um, if you, as we were mentioning before about a, a kind of a, a light touch with something, pinprick is kind of slightly different because it's challenging, but a light touch with something um, that you wouldn't expect to be painful. And it generates, it evokes pain. That's allodynia, and um, and that can change for people. Yeah, it can. You've seen um, that. Yeah, you see the because um, allodynia is is a complex kind of thing, and it's a mixture of uh, sensory sensitization, uh, particularly in the spinal cord, where all the nerves are plugging into, and it's how the spinal cord then processes that. And it can, as I said, it can serve up larger information, or you know, kind of. Um, increase the sensory response and so it serves it up to the brain in a, in a kind of a louder way um, and so it's interpreted as pain mm -hmm. um, and so it's um, it's a really good measure actually for how sensitized the nervous system can be mm -hmm. or, or is and um, 
certainly when we look at the kinds of things that you were talking about, Graham, about um, you know altering the experience, we can see those areas of allodynia start to shrink mm. and start to change, and the sensitivity within that area can change as well. And it's really um, this is just plasticity at work, and you know it's fascinating to see. It's really you know inspiring to see as well. But when people have, have done that as well, and they've been you know they've been motivated to kind of to work on that, and yeah, it's, it's really inspiring. So, so the long answer to the short question is, it's not just all in your head. No. Yeah. <laughs>